hides over the village. Across Loch and Dole is the area known as the Rins of Isla, where some of the island's prettiest villages are situated. Many people find them rather like Irish villages in appearance, and I tend to agree. This is Port Charlotte. Its lighthouse was built in 1869. Isla has been referred to in song as Isla of the Blue-Green Grass. I'd say that's quite apt. Much of the land here is particularly arable. At one time, Isla ranked highest in importance of all the islands off the west coast of Scotland. It was the seat of the Macdonalds, Lords of the Isles, who were extremely powerful during the 14th century. So much so that they considered themselves of equal rank to the Scottish kings, if not even higher. The Lordship of the Isles made its own independent treaties with England, France and Ireland, and sometimes against the Scottish interest. It was ruled from two islands on this loch. The main island, or Castle Island, was the principal residence, and Council Island was the official seat of Parliament. The Sound of Isla. And right next to it, of course, what else but another distillery, Colila Distillery. Bunahaving single malt is also produced on this stretch of coastline, a little further north. and Losset Castle. And nearby, Port Askic, one of the two gateways to Isla. All was considered to be the most scenic and interesting approach. The redevelopment work linked to the expansion of the harbour facility here involved a public inquiry before planning approval was granted, and it still proves controversial in terms of its effect on the local environment. Time now to cross to the Isle of Jura. There have long been strong ties between Isla, Jura, and their neighbor to the north, the island of Colonsey. Jura is one of the steepest and craggiest islands in the Inner Hebrides. From the far north coast are views of one of the largest permanent whirlpools on Earth, Corryvrechgan. According to folklore, Kelpies, water horses, and mermaids live quite happily beneath these waters. Corryvrechgan is so dangerous that the Royal Navy considers it to be unnavigable. Many people have perished in Corryvrechgan, as is testified in the dark, poetic lines, there is death and woe in this blood-stained flow. There are many unspoiled areas across the moors and hills of Jura, and to explore this environment can often feel as though one is entirely alone in the world. In fact, the population of Jura is very small these days. However, there are over 5,000 deer and a sizable number of goats. Adders are also plentiful, and it's best to wear sensible footwear. To the northeast of the island is Barn Hill, where the celebrated author George Orwell spent the final years of his life. The people of Jura referred to him by his real name. To those who knew him, he was simply Mr. Blair, a quiet and unassuming man by all accounts, 
George Orwell, or Eric Blair, first visited Jura in 1945. He moved there the following year. Orwell preferred its solitude and space to the cares of London. He wrote 1984 in Jura. In the end, though, he contracted tuberculosis and was forced to return south. The population of Jura once exceeded a thousand. The west coast, however, has always been underpopulated, apart from a small settlement at Glengarrisdale. It's now deserted. There are beautiful beaches in the northwest and no shortage of caves. This one contained a human skull and bones, alleged to be the remains of an unfortunate member of the clan Maclean, murdered by the Campbells in the 17th century. Glengarrisdale is a rather lonely spot these days. In comparison with Isla, Jura is certainly remote and less accessible. The moorland here seems endless, and it can be a bit hazardous to wander about during the stag shooting season for fear of being mistaken for a deer it's best to seek prior permission. Large areas of Jura are officially recognized as private hunting ground. popular drove route for Isla cattle on the way to Falkirk Market in the 18th and 19th centuries was through Jura. The herds were then ferried across the Sound of Jura to the mainland. It's said that the drovers very often enjoyed a convivial time, shall we say, on the journey. An engineer employed by Thomas Telford and Jura once made the crossing to the mainland in appalling conditions. And his observations are interesting. On arriving at the ferry, we found every corner of the inn crowded with drovers who had been detained by the weather for several days and were passing their time, as was their wont, in riotous and continuous drinking. Sounds like quite good fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> 